Well, good morning. Nice to see all you guys. Smiling faces. And uh, I was going to say it's a great day to be inside at a symposium, but then the sun came out. <laughs> but hey, that's good news always. So uh, before I, I jump in and, and start talking about food waste, I wanted to uh, take a step back and think about what an interesting time this is for environmentalism in general. And uh, when I say that, in particular, I'm talking about how some issues are really embraced and adopted by communities and individuals, uh, but then other issues are, are not. Uh, so uh, what I find can be odd is, is which ones we do choose to embrace and which ones are ignored. So uh, just to, to get you in the mood here, um, as an example, this piece of paper here. Okay, well now it's trash. Or is it? And in some communities, simply putting this in the trash can instead of in the recycling bin would elicit disgust, uh, possibly even anger. And I see some nodding heads there. Um, I might get in trouble in this room if, if I were to do that. Uh, but same thing with this can of soda. Uh, you know, putting it in the wrong place is, is totally frowned upon. And taking it one step further, if I were to just throw these on the ground, littering, then uh, not only would I be running afoul of our societal mores, I'd in some places be breaking the law. Yet at the same time, in every community in this country, food waste is not only accepted, it's commonplace. And we see it all over the, the place in communities where people at restaurants are sending back half their plates with food that they could take home. Uh, schools, you'll see kids throwing out uh, completely whole apples or, or milk cartons. And maybe even at conferences where people might take a, a couple bites out of a pastry and throw the rest away. And I can pretty much guarantee you that at any conference, it would be more taboo to not recycle that can or bottle than to throw out half of what's on your plate. Uh, so why is that? Why do we have this discrepancy? Well, mostly it's because there hasn't been that consensus established that food waste is something we need to combat. And uh, when that happens, as we have seen with a, a couple issues, such as littering, we are able to overcome and, and even change that behavior fairly rapidly. Um, and behavior change isn't something that's, that's easy to change. But uh, through campaigns like the litter bug and with recycling, uh, a variety of campaigns, it seems like every community has their own, um, we've really made great strides in a short amount of time. So that message has been internalized, and it's been so internalized that, that many of us will feel guilty about not recycling something that could be. And, and I'm no different there. I'll, I'll walk a long way out of my way to recycle something instead of throwing it out. I've even been known to bring it home to recycle. Um, I'm sure that that rings true to many of you. Uh, so, so why is that? Um, you know, something as small as a can of soda, uh, if we landfill that, will never impact a life like a can of soup might. But we'll often be wasting that food. Um, even if we were to send hundreds of cans to the landfill, while that's unfortunate, it's nowhere near as heartbreaking as the food that we send to the landfill every day. So uh, I bring up these, these two topics for comparison, littering and recycling, not to denigrate them at all. Um, far from it. It's, it's more to draw a comparison and, and to, to strike a note of optimism, where uh, these are, are causes that have, have really caught on in a short amount of time. And, um, and to say that once that consensus develops for uh, reducing food waste and making it an issue we care about, we will really be able to have great success in a short amount of time. So, so we can definitely do that. We, today, we're at the cusp of what I believe is, is the next big movement in green, and that is reducing food waste. So exciting times for, for me, for someone who's, who's really focused on this issue for so long. And uh, I hope that by the end of today's talk, I'll have convinced you that 
that food waste is an issue worth tackling and it's one that we can really dent and have an impact on. All right, so that's my little rah-rah uh, lecture to begin and now I will take a step back to uh, talk a little bit about how I got into this whole issue. Um, and in the introduction I was referred to as a food waste expert and I always chuckle at that. It's not something that I set out to be. Um, I find it, the whole thing a bit strange. But anyway, I got started on this issue, uh, or I became aware of how much food we waste from a volunteer opportunity not too far from here at DC Central Kitchen. And I, I see some nodding heads. Uh, that's a food recovery group in the area. And basically, they'll go out and recover food that other people will throw out. Restaurants, caterers, uh, schools. Yes, many, many cafeterias have, have excess waste or excess food that would go to waste if, if it were not for these places. So anyway, I was volunteering at DC Central Kitchen one day and my role there, my job, I was tasked with making a big vat of pasta. And if you can picture a witch's cauldron, it's, uh, that's kind of what it looked like. And I was stirring it with what seemed like a, an oar from a rowboat. Um, all that to say, I had plenty of time to look around and, and notice what was happening. And I saw all kinds of nice, beautiful looking foods that people were bringing by. Um, racks of ribs, legs of lamb, and, and delicious looking vegetables. And these were all things that were designated to be thrown out by someone else. So the, the question that came into my mind, and that's really informed my research for the last five years, is what happens in places that don't have these food recovery groups? So uh, with that in mind, I started my blog, wastedfood.com. And from that, uh, that led to the book that came out last fall, American Wasteland. And since that time, I've really had a chance to go around a bit and engage with people and, and discuss the topic. And that's been the most enjoyable part for me, to, to talk about the issue, try and shed light on it, and get some feedback. So definitely. Uh, Think up some questions or, or note them as we go through the talk, and, and we'll hopefully have a nice discussion at the end. OK, so uh, those, that's kind of the broad introduction of, of who I am. But you should know three things about me, OK? I love food. I'm sure I'm not alone in this room. I grew up in a house where we learned to enjoy food both as, as something to eat, but also uh, as something to be valued. And the idea of not taking home food from a restaurant or the leftovers was something that, that just wasn't done. Um, I've been writing about food for about 10 years as a journalist. And uh, it's definitely the first thing that comes to mind when I think about new cities I'm going to visit. It's kind of like, where am I going to eat? <laughs> OK. Um, I love leftovers, as you might guess. And uh, what you see here are some extra hot dog buns from a Friday night barbecue. And in my mind, that just means we're going to have a great Saturday breakfast of French toast. Um, it's something that it, once you start thinking that way, it's, it's really habit forming and can be really fun. And finally, I waste food. Everybody does, and I'm no different. And if someone who's thinking about food waste pretty much all day long is letting things go bad in his refrigerator. Chances are that, that you are too. And I think you'd be surprised if you took an inventory uh, of, of how much stuff you are letting go bad in your home. And these are all uh, sad stories from my own kitchen here. <laughs> um, OK, so just to give a little overview of today's talk, uh, we're going to establish ex exactly how much we do waste and then talk about why that is so, why it matters, and then building up to the all-important what we can do about it. OK, so looking at the big picture here, how much food do we waste? Well, the best, most recent statistic found that of all the food we produce in this country, 40% isn't eaten. So it's a staggering amount. And when you add it all up, it's about 160 billion pounds per year. And that is a fairly conservative estimate. And doing a, a rough one-to-one -one translation on the cost, it's about $160 billion that, 
we could be spending a whole bunch of other places. So some numbers there, but what does that actually look like? Well, if we were to bring all the food wasted in the US to one central location, we waste enough every day to fill the Rose Bowl, which is this 90,000 seat stadium that you see here. And I'm not just talking about the field itself, but the entire stadium. So um, congratulations, we are a very wasteful country and, and I think we might hold the title of most wasteful nation in the world. Um, anyhow, so room for improvement. Now, where does this happen? Where are we wasting food? Well, it's really throughout the food chain from farms, and these are some pears that I, I saw on the ground at an orchard in California, on to supermarkets. These are bags of lettuce that had reached their sell-by date and uh, thus ended up in the dumpster. On to schools, both with young kids and college students or in the all-you-can-eat setting. This is where this photo comes from. Uh, or as I like to call it, all you can waste. And then on to homes. And many of you might be wondering how I snuck into your house and got this picture. <laughs> and I'll, I, I'm not going to divulge my secrets. All right, so why does, this, why does this happen? Why are we wasting so much? Well, there are a bunch of reasons, and the first one um, probably doesn't come as, as too much of a surprise. Food is tremendously cheap. Now, I know that... <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I don't know why you're laughing. Um, now, I really like this picture because not only does it convey just how cheap food is, you know, 99 cents a pound, it doesn't get much cheaper than that. But, uh, but also the, the nice pun of, of happy Passover, get your pork ribs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so many of you might be thinking, well, hold on, haven't food prices been rising in the last couple of years? And, and they have been for sure. But when you look at the amount we spend on food uh, as a percentage of household spending, it's historically low. It's about 10%. And so not only is it at an all-time low for the U.S., but no other nation in the world spends as little on food. And that really has an impact. Uh, we just, a, a simple rationale is we don't tend to value things we don't pay much for. You can think about, in your own home, the, the food items that you pay decent money for. Let, let's say you go to the farmer's market and buy an organic local chicken. You're going to use all of that bird. Whereas if you buy the frozen one at the store for, $20, for $5 versus $20, um, chances are you might not be as careful with it. OK, next up, food is abundant. And we see so much food everywhere, not only from the brimming displays at supermarkets, but, but now it's at gas stations, pharmacies, hardware stores even, uh, big box retailers. And uh, it's, it's really just everywhere you turn. And this photo is a, a picture that conveys the, the abundance on farms. And it's from a gleaning outing where uh, volunteers will show up at a farm that has extra crops. They're otherwise going to plow them under. So um, these are sweet potatoes that, that we helped pick. And at every gleaning event I've been to, there has been at least as much in the field left when we're done as when we started. Our, uh, so there's just so much that can be gleaned, but it's hard work. Uh, thirdly, portion size. And any of you who have been out to eat in the last five years, this might look like something you've been served. Not even sure what it is, to be honest. It <laughs> uh, looks like some sort of omelet. Um, I call it a mountain of eggs. But, um, but we're often put in this position where we have a choice. We can either overeat or we can waste. And sometimes, if the portions are large enough, we can do both. Um, now, there is a, another way where, where you could take home leftovers, but some people don't want to do that. Some people aren't going home right after. So uh, that's something that really needs to be addressed. OK, and, and here's another <laughs> picture to convey that. Um, I was driving along, and I had to pull over and take a, a photo of this, because uh, I just 
get a kick out of how overt the, the message is that large portions are, are a real part of the appeal. Um, and not that I've ever been to this restaurant. But. <laughs> All right, superficiality is another real driver of waste. And this idea that food has to look perfect and it has to be homogenous. So on that display, all the apples are the same shape, the same size, and if any one of them has a blemish, they're just taken off. And I worked at a supermarket in the produce department for part of my research, and I spent a good portion of my days just going through those displays and picking out anything that had a bruise and didn't quite look right. Um, now I know that, that folks involved with growing their own food or going to farmer's markets uh, are starting to see the fallacy of that and, and that food, real food, doesn't look perfect all the time and that appearance shouldn't trump taste. But for the majority of us, it, it still does. Expiration dates are another real cause of waste uh, when people just put too much faith in them. And they're really everywhere. I was astounded to find them printed right on an egg um, as if it came out from the hen that way. <laughs> um, and there's a great Seinfeld joke about uh, the hen like whispering the date after the egg has been, <laughs> has been <laughs> birthed. But that's not really what happens. Um, and so anyway, those dates have uh, so much caution built into them. Um, and I should note that you know many of you know that, that there is that cushion built into the dates. But I wonder how many people know that expiration dates aren't required. And it's just optional. Uh, manufacturers, one started it and the others followed suit. And the only thing that is required by law to have a date on it is infant formula. And this is a fun cartoon that kind of drives home our attitude toward goods past that date. Um, it's kind of hard to read, but most creative marketing technique for merchandise past its expiration date award. And the, the sign says, take a walk on the wild side. So uh, there's this idea that we're really pushing it if we, if we eat anything after midnight on the day that's printed. <laughs> OK, uh, and finally, there is a certain squeamishness that comes from uh, goods that have reached that date or, or maybe something with a little bit of mold on it. Um, and people have gotten away from using a paring knife or, or really just scooping out the mold on the top and eating what's underneath. And the, the prevailing motto seems to be, when in doubt, throw it out. And I actually had that message read or, or printed right on my takeout box when I uh, took home leftovers from a restaurant. And I was just so astounded by that, because not only are they only giving me 24 hours to eat this food, and it's printed right on that box, but, but they're saying, you know, after that date, you know, don't take any chances, just throw it out, which is just not the message we need to receive, because we're already doing that uh, to an excess, I'd say. OK, so the next section here, why should you care? And you might be wondering that. It's a good question to ask. Uh, I had the chance to tell a veteran newspaper man, uh, a New York Times editor, about my research topic. And this was way back at the beginning. I just started researching it. I was really excited. I was jazzed about the topic. I said, hey, Jack, uh, I'm, I'm researching food waste. What do you think? He said, yeah, all right. Sounds fairly interesting, but why do I care? And to be honest, I didn't have a great answer at that time. Um, I, it seemed sort of self-evident that food waste was wrong because it just was. And I wanted to say something to that effect. You know, We shouldn't waste food just because. Isn't it obvious? But it turns out that's not the stuff of books. And uh, so I, what I had to do was really go back to the drawing board and craft an argument on why it matters and why you should care. So I've done that. And basically, there are environmental, ethical, and economic reasons why food waste matters. So I'm going to go through those. Uh, starting off with environmentalism, um, there's two main causes uh, or two main uh, effects of food waste on the environment. Number one, when we throw out food, we're throwing out a whole bunch of resources that have gone, in, gone into growing those foods. Um, so that specifically means energy and oil, mostly. And uh, 
there's a great stat that about 2% of all US energy consumption goes to growing food that we then turn around and throw out. And there's just this oil built up and, and embedded throughout our food chain, and it goes into everything, like fertilizer, to the diesel used to plant and harvest the crops, onto processing, uh, even transporting our food cross country in many cases, and cooling it throughout the process of, of the whole food chain. And uh, even in your own home, you know, the energy used to cook it and to keep it cool, but then also when we're done with it, sending it off to the landfill. So uh, a tremendous amount of oil embedded in that, uh, the whole food chain. Um, now, 2%, that figure I gave you, it's, it's a massive amount, but it kind of sounds small. Um, and, and as a journalist, it's not uh, a headline grabber by any means. So here's a, a picture to, that hopefully drives home how much oil we do squander. Well, this is a, an overhead view of the deep water horizon leak from this past summer. And uh, obviously a, a tremendous disaster, but every year we waste 70 times, seven zero. 70 times that amount of oil through the food that we waste. Okay, and water is another resource that is, is embedded in our food chain heavily. And about 90% of consumptive water use goes to growing food. Uh, so to then turn around and squander about 40% of what we grow it just doesn't make sense in a day and age where water is becoming increasingly rare. The second main environmental cause uh, of, or the, the second main environmental impact of waste is that when we send food to the landfill, it's causing problems. Simple equation, food to landfill is bad. Um, why is that? Well, when things decompose without air or anaerobically, then it emits methane. And methane is a nasty greenhouse gas that's 23 times as potent at trapping heat as CO2. Uh, so when you look at the impact of landfills, it's uh, the number two cause of human-related methane. And food is the main source of methane in landfills. So the, the take-home message here is that we are aiding climate change from our waste bins. And this picture here is a methane vent at a landfill I visited, and it's, it's just slowly seeping methane into the environment, into the atmosphere. And, and the larger landfills are required to uh, destroy or flare methane, but the, the smaller ones are not. Okay, shifting gears, uh, we'll talk about ethics here. And when I raise this topic, many people think about the, the mantra of clean your plate, there are starving children somewhere. And, and the country has changed throughout the generations. Um, and I think that's useful in some ways, uh, harmful in others. Um, the idea of, of bringing guilt to the dinner table probably isn't a great thing in terms of eating disorders. But the core idea that we need to value our food is sound. Um, so, so just because what's left on your plate isn't going to get to someone starving in some other country or even around the block in your same town uh, doesn't mean that you can then just wantonly waste food. So we're not off the hook, ethically speaking, uh, just because that saying is a little flawed. Uh, but primarily, when you think about ethics, um, I think of hunger. And when people think of hunger, a lot of folks think of the Depression and bread lines there. But American hunger is not a thing of the past. It is alive and well today, and, and in fact, there are more hungry Americans now than there ever have been. Now, partly that's because there are more Americans than there ever have been, but certainly a, a topic that needs to be considered and, and often is swept under the rug. Uh, so when you think about how much food we produce, uh, I mentioned the abundance. It's about twice the amount of calories that we need per person per year. Uh, so to produce that much and then turn around and waste about 40% of it when so many people don't have enough to eat, to me that is disgraceful. And I would call it morally callous. So the, the impact there, you know, just to, to drive it home, I mean, these are two people that I talked to, Roy and Diane, 
who had been homeless and are, are getting back on their feet, but they had been hungry and they are not wasting any food in their home. I mean, they're probably wasting a little, but they are going out of their way to, to really value food because they know what it's like to go without. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. And I won't lecture you on that any further. Okay, economics is a fairly simple equation. I mentioned the uh, $160 billion wasted per year. That's a conservative estimate again. Um, but closer to home, the, family of, the average family of four, that is uh, a, a figure that I got from the USDA average spending amounts. There's a range of what people spend, but roughly $1,300 to $2,200 a year you're throwing out. And I'm sure that's money that folks would like to spend elsewhere. And to give a more specific example on that, uh, with federal spending, I know the, this is the, the budget time of year in Washington. Um, so here's you know, a large line item with uh, food spending, the school lunch program. While it works wonders, uh, the way we serve food sometimes leads to great amounts of waste, about a hundred, uh, one and a half billion dollars that is just being thrown out. And uh, in addition to changing the quality and kinds of foods that we're serving, which people have been doing great work on that, uh, I'd like to see some effort put into how we serve food. Um, I've, I've been to schools and at lunchtime and you look in the waste bin and it's unopened cartons of milk and whole apples and and as anyone who has kids or was a kid knows, it's always the healthiest things that are thrown out first. Okay, so here's the, the big moment here. What can we do about this issue? Uh, I think we'll all admit that, that we do have a problem. Uh, combating it is the main chore, though. Uh, how do we do that? Well, there's a nice model that I'm sure you're familiar with, the reduce, reuse, recycle mantra. And uh, as seen here, it's often portrayed in this inverted triangle, meaning that the reduce is more important than recycling. And I think that's a useful guide to figuring out how we go about uh, addressing food waste. And the EPA, helpfully, has come out with just such an inverted triangle. Um, it, some of the writing's a little small, so I'll read it off, but at the top, it's you know, standing in for reduction is source reduction. That's their phrase for it. And then uh, the, the reusing of food, that sounds a bit odd. Maybe repurposing, we'll say, um, would be going to feed hungry people or with, with items that aren't of a high enough quality for, for those who don't have enough to eat. Then it's sending that food to animals, livestock. And uh, then if we can't do either of those, it's recycling. And in a, a food setting, that basically means either industrial uses, as they say, which basically means rendering, or uh, composting, or creating energy. And as a last resort, you know, only if, the, if we can't do anything else, is incineration or sending it to landfill. And uh, too often, that is, is not a last resort. About 97% of the food waste we create is sent to incineration or landfill. So, it's pretty staggering. It's actually 2.5% of all food is recycled. So uh, plenty of room for improvement. So let's see. What can we do here more specifically to, to impact this issue? Well, you know, this being so close to the seat of power and the legislative bodies, how about enacting some legislation to, to help us here? Uh, the next farm bill, I'd love to see food donation written in, in some capacity. And with so many farms receiving federal money to produce so much food, how about putting it in somewhere, if, if you're taking that money, you have to at least harvest all that you grow. Um, and then if, if not that, then, then at least allowing people to come glean your, the excess crops. Another idea would be to streamline tax don deductions. Uh, supermarkets and farms that give are eligible for tax deductions, but many don't take them because it's seen as a, a bit of a nuisance. So uh, making that easier and also making it apply to all farms instead of just the incorporated large ones. That would be, uh, at present, unincorporated farms aren't eligible. 
Um, okay, and then one other thing is, is to fund gleaning. And there are some AmeriCorps operations that have taken on this, this awesome task, but uh, it's just so massive. There's so much excess that we really need to see a national program to try and recapture some of those uh, healthy, abundant goods. Okay, another idea um, would be to have someone in the federal apparatus whose job it is to focus on this issue. And this is, the gentleman pictured is Joel Berg, and in the late 90s, he worked at the USDA as the food recovery coordinator. And that's the only time that anyone has ever been employed by the government to worry about these issues. And it hasn't happened since. He, uh, he lost his position when the, the Bush administration came to power in 2001. So, um, you know, two, two million people roughly, more than two million federal employees, uh, all I'm asking for is one more. I don't think that's asking too much. All right. Um, we need some new data. There, uh, there isn't great data available on this topic. The only, uh, the most recent USDA study that came out was from 1997, and, uh, or the most recent study that took into account the entire food chain was from 1997, and it used data from 95. So um, we're getting ready to have a sweet 16 party for that study. Uh, it's time for something new. And this illustration here is a, a campaign from the UK where they really have invested in, in research on, on numbers. And it's, it's made an impact where they're able to make these kind of eye-catching uh, propaganda or materials to get out and, and it's caught public attention and also the media. Um, so if, you, if we have more recent numbers, it will lead to more attention. Um, and speaking of attention, how about public awareness campaigns? Um, as you can tell, I'm a big fan of, of public awareness campaigns like the litter bug um, or my favorite here, Woodsy the Owl. And they're effective. Uh, they may be a little hokey, but they really talk to kids and uh, communicate the issues. And I don't know about you, but I, I can't remember the last time I went into the woods and left some trash there. So, so Woodsy's doing his job. All right. And uh, lastly, supporting diversion. And when I use that term, diversion, it basically means diverting food from landfills. And uh, the approach I tend to take on that is by any means necessary. So whether it's composting or anaerobic digestion or sending it to a worm bin or feeding hogs, um, it's all, all uh, progressive ideas. So uh, what I'd love to see would be some incentives for actually having that happen in municipalities, um, whether it's the carrot or the stick approach. I don't really care. Places have tried both. And, uh, and frankly, I think it's the kind of idea that once it, it is proposed, there'll be some objections at first, but once people start doing it, it's not that difficult. It will, will work. Um, and in particular, we, what we need before we can compost or create energy from it is source-separated organics and the idea of separating out food and other organics from your waste stream. And so that's a behavior change that has to be promoted, and um, that's where the data and public awareness campaigns will really come in handy. Okay, um, a few wishes here. These are, this is looking way into the, the future, or maybe not, but um, less likely to happen, but this would be amazing. Uh, how about if we had a, a section of the supermarket for discounted items? I know some stores have that already, but uh, let's make it more of an established thing. And uh, there's this wonderful term from Sweden. There's a, a word called lagom. And there is no English translation for it, which I find beautiful because uh, it, well, and troubling. But it basically, it basically means having just the right amount. And having just the right amount is better than having too much. Um, it's sort of like the Goldilocks principle. I think it'd be just right. So um, if we can get that to catch on, that would be neat. Uh, more portion choice at restaurants. Uh, there's a picture there of the TGI Fridays, right portion, right price menu, and, and I like to give them a little kudos every time I give a talk, because they're the only chain that's really doing that on a, a national level. 
And, and the idea that one size fits all is, is false. It, it does not. Um, the last two things, uh, having some funding for composting, separation of organics, uh, maybe even waste to energy. There's a county near me in North Carolina that basically funds restaurant composting. And uh, it's, it's actually in everyone's benefit. The county can save money by getting that waste and the really heavy waste out of its waste stream. So um, that's something that, that's extremely beneficial. And the ultimate wish I would have would be a complete ban on food from landfills. And I many of you might say, well, that's never going to happen. But Norway has actually just done that. And uh, I'm excited to see what the results are there and, and what the knock-on impact is. And I do think that if we did ban food from landfills, there would be a real ripple effect up the food chain. OK, um, so how about you? What can you do? Uh, those are, are more of the legislative or, or policy-based changes. But you find folks sitting here. Um, you know, what can you do? Well, a quick stat for you. There was a study done in a county in New York that looked at all of the waste produced in that county. And basically, homes produced the most. Um, there are so many homes, you know, the, the aggregate total, it was 40% of all the food produced in that county. So there's good news and bad news there. The bad news is that we, as individuals and families, are really wasteful. But the good news is that we can have a massive impact if we just set our mind to it. And some people might say, well, you know, what's one person's, in, what's one person's behavior going to do? But that is completely false. I think that way of thinking is, is troublesome. Because if you do the right thing, it'll be contagious. And, and once, that, once people, your friends, your family, they see you doing something, then they'll mimic that. And, and it definitely will catch on like dominoes. OK, so specifically, uh, if you're only going to do one thing, it would be to be a smarter shopper. And when I say that, I mean bring less food into your home. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Just eat what you buy, um, if, if I were to distill it into one sentence. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that. I think it's, um, oh, you guys are whispering about my shopping list. <laughs> No one, no one here buys snakes at the supermarket. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, some. <laughs> yeah, well, in some cultures that is food. Uh, I, I think, I think that might be have been intended to be snacks, but, uh, but I, but who knows? It's open for interpretation. Um, anyway, the the key point there is you know whatever strategy works for you, whether it's really planning out your shopping. Or, or just going more frequently and buying less each time. Just bring less food into your own home so you don't put yourself in this position where you have too much food and you have no choice but to you know, let it go to waste. And I think a lot of people are, uh, well, they aren't realistic with themselves. And we all lead busy lives. And at the same time, we know what foods we should eat. So we go to the store and buy all these fresh goods. And we think we're going to make these homemade meals. You get out of work at 6.30 or 7, it's not happening. And it just keeps getting pushed on until the next night and the next night while we get left, or, uh, while we get takeout. So be realistic. Um, portion size. Uh, maybe not this small of a portion, but uh, I think there's a happy medium between this picture and the mountain of eggs we saw before. So um, it's, you know, being smart about what you put on your plates will help the environment, it'll help your budget, and it'll also probably save your waistline. Um, but at the same time, our plates are often part of the problem. So maybe it's that our plates are too big. Uh, expiration dates, we talked about that a little bit before. Just some simple advice. Ignore expiration dates, OK? And trust your senses. Um, now, my lawyers, my team of lawyers would have me say that I am no food safety expert, but I think you will be fine. Um, I think you, if you've never smelled bad milk, chances are you haven't had bad milk before. <laughs> You'll know it when you smell it. All right, and loving your leftovers. I think there are two kinds of people. There are leftover lovers and not so much, people who don't like leftovers. 
But if you're in that second category, uh, I would really just advise to, to think about it as a way to save time, money, and effort, and also a chance to be creative, um, to create something new out of what remains. It's almost like kitchen alchemy. So take that as a challenge. And finally, uh, use your freezer as your friend. And if things are going bad or approaching that date and you know you won't use them, you can always throw it in the freezer and it's basically a waste the layer. Um, that's how I like to see it. <clears throat> now, uh, that doesn't mean you can just shove everything in there and it'll magically be good forever. There is such a thing as, as freezer burn and if you do something like we see in this picture here, you're not gonna be able to see anything and you're gonna lose it all or, or the stuff pushed to the back. So um, don't just throw it all in there haphazardly. Um, finally, I want to issue a little challenge here. Um, I talked before about home food waste and we essentially throw out one fourth of the food we bring into our home. So here's an idea. How about buying one fourth less in the next couple weeks as you're doing your shopping? I think you will be surprised by how much less food you waste and also how much uh, you don't overeat and you'll, you'll eat more reasonable portions, I'm betting. Um, so, so give that a shot. And if you need a little bit of, uh, of a boost here, uh, the stakes are pretty high. And uh, you know I, I joke around a lot in the presentation to try to communicate the message, but this is serious business uh, when you look at the numbers. Uh, by 2050, they say there are going to be 9 billion of us on this planet. And that's a lot of zeros and a lot of mouths to feed. So the effect of that, a lot of people say, we'll, we'll have to turn to GMO crops. And who knows, that, that may be, but that may not be. Here's another idea. Let's be more efficient with what we grow and distribute it better and redistribute what, uh, what is out there. So um, with that, I'm, I think efficiency is, is a key. And I definitely think it's an exciting time here. Um, this food waste reduction is at, admittedly a fringe idea. But 20 years ago, the same could be said of recycling. And, and that was a bit out there. Today, 60% of Americans can recycle at their curbside. So think of how quickly that has spread and become adopted. and, and taken as gospel. So um, sooner or later, we are going to have to address the issue of food waste as the demographics and population shifts um, and, and increases. So uh, my advice would be let's tackle it sooner rather than later. So with that, I will take questions. And thanks very much.